All right, we are on our way to Honor Amongst Thieves, uh, an early showing of the movie, so not only do I not have other people's uh, predictions to go with, I also don't have any early reviews of the movie to work on, but uh, I strongly suspect that Hugh Grant's um, Forge, Forge Fitzwilliam or something like that, uh, will hire the party for the initial job and turn out to be working for the Red Wizards of Thay and ultimately betray them. Um, um, it seems to me like Zank the Paladin is a very late addition to the film and not like fully part of the party. Um, it seems like we're going to start with the, the bard, the barbarian, pick up the, uh, pick up the sorcerer, and then finally the, the druid later on. I think the Paladin is kind of like an NPC vibe of uh, just kind of passing through and, and helping out. Um, the red horn thing that seems to be like the main object of the film uh, is it's got to have something to do with an undead army but to be honest I didn't see any undead in those like little shots of the finale so maybe it has much more to do with like controlling those dragon statues or something like that maybe is it something special to the city of Waterdeep um, I throw that prediction in there uh, I'm also going to assume uh, this is kind of bold. I don't think anyone's going to die. I think this is like, like a D&D movie certainly could have character death. I feel like all of these people are fun and charismatic enough, and this is like a family-friendly romp kind of thing, that, that no one's actually going to stay down. Um, and then, lastly, uh, my prediction is that that maze situation that they have going on uh, is going to be right about the midpoint, right after they've discovered that they've been betrayed. Um, so that, I think, is going to be, like, it, it, it seemed pretty fun in the trailers, but all of the, the characters' reactions to things were, like, purely, like, sad. So I'm guessing that they are, like, at their low point there. All right, so I have just seen the movie with uh, my fellow compatriots here. Um, this is Arthur and my lovely wife, Allie. Um, we just came out of Honor Amongst Thieves. What did you guys think, and why should someone go see the movie, Allie? I loved it. It was very fun, even for a non-D&D player. Um, definitely see it if you like humor, like real humor, not Morbius humor. And, and generally action sometimes tug on your heartstrings but like not too much and Arthur what'd you think it was a lot better than what I expected we were talking earlier and um, we were talking about how the trailer was was very what, 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 how we say? well the ad I saw was super sketchy yeah. it was really sketchy for it, but it ended up being a lot better than I thought it was and I like it because if you are a D&D player, you get the references and you get the little bits of things that they're throwing out for you. But also, if you're not a D&D player, it's really cool just to see all these things come together. And you don't even have to have a background in D&D to enjoy the movie because it's actually genuinely really funny. All right. <sighs> all right. So, I just got back from Honor Amongst Thieves, the D&D movie. Here's what I thought. Um, first of all, I love the movie. I had a great time in the theater. Um, a particular highlight, I think, was the comedy, which comes through really well in the trailer, but it is not just a, like, there for the trailers, like, throwaway jokes. It is pretty consistently humorous in a way that is both self-aware and also somehow grounded. Like, it, I, I feel like the jokes are the kind of thing where it's like, there's never a point where you're like, that person wouldn't say that. That's ridiculous. Like, it's clearly, like, just a joke for the audience. Like, everything feels, like, appropriate to the characters who are in the scene. And yet, it is, like, it is very much that Marvel style of, like, what's happening to us right now is crazy. And then making jokes about that. Um, that's coming from a, more of a place of, like, coping with what's going on than anything. Which is very, very fun and very appropriate, and I, I feel like very D&D &D as well. Um, there are 
there are bits in the film where the different personalities go really well together and, and create a humorous effect. Um, there are a couple of people, obviously Michelle Rodriguez is barbarian, um, but surprising standout was, uh, was Sophie, someone's, uh, Doric the, the Druid, are both very good, like, straight-faced, um, like, straight men for bits that either Chris Pine is doing or Simon is doing, um, or, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna be using actor names and character names interchangeably because some of these people I know, some of these people I do not know, and that's, uh, that's on me. I should know those. Um, Hugh Grant is very, very good at portraying this particular, like, Forge character. He's a delight to see on screen, and I think all of the different personalities, they, they establish a certain rapport with, with each of the other characters, um, that is in its own way humorous, but also has certain kernels of meaning. The characters also have, um, kind of like these reoccurring bits, that I think is very, like, I wrote this into my, like, D&D <laughs> character sheet, and I have to keep referencing it sometimes, um, when it might not necessarily be relevant. Um, I can think of one character in particular who has um, a bit that starts very early on, you know, one minute into the movie, um, and it comes up again and again all the way into the finale, and um, it's <laughs> it's a little, like... I wish we could cut this, but it it's it comes up in such pivotal and important moments that it's like, well, you, you can't cut that footage. So, but um, so sometimes the humor does get in its own way, um, but I think it's it it does so in a way that a D and D fan would be like, I I have also been there. I have also written down that my character loves this particular food, and then the DM did a bunch of stuff with that, and now I I don't feel as strongly about it as the DM does. Um, that's kind of the, the feeling that you get from it, right? It's like the characters are less attached to their own, uh, their own character than the world is. Uh, one thing that I enjoyed, I think that the plotting was actually very, very good. Um, it did have that D&D sense of like, all we need is A, and then A, you get to A, and it's like, oh, we can't get that, but we can if we get B, and then, oh, we can't get that, we can if we get C, and it, it kind of does this uh, extensive out and back, which I think is, um, it's a it's a relatively common adventure plot, um, but I, I think it, it, the movie does it really well. Every time that you're about to get to the next thing, you feel like you're gonna snap back and get all the way to the finale, and then there's just the one more, and just the one more, um, and and when when you do get to the end of that chain and reverse and start like coming through all of that, um, I think that the payoff is, is really good. It, it feels very, like, bombastic and immediate and, like, here we go. Um, one thing that surprised me was how deep the, the emotional moments of the movie were. You sort of, you know, it's really tough to get that balance between humor and some sort of emotionality. And um, my assumption based on the trailer and based on interviews and everything was... Hey, like, this is going to be a fun romp. You know, this is going to be a fun little adventure movie. And it was, um, but there are a couple of moments um, that really hit home. And I think it's because the actors are doing such a good job. Um, in particular, I think that Chris Pine essentially is this movie. Um, it might be an ensemble cast. It might be, you know, a D&D &D party. It, Chris Pine is the heart of the comedy, the heart of all these relationships, the heart of the plot, um, and in a very, like, um, not literal, but in the more literative sense, is the heart of that emotional uh, core of that movie. And so um, I think all of the emotional moments that play out that really, like, uh, get you um, are rooted in Chris Pine's ability to, to deliver those lines and to make those facial expressions and to, um, to really convey the depths of, like, tragedy, and, and tragedy in a person who is relentlessly optimistic. And I, and I think he does such a good job bringing this character to life who is, um, who is sort of, like, positive and radiant and optimistic, but that, that radiance and optimism is rooted in serious pain. And I, I think that all of that comes through, um, and it's really moving. Uh, when you when he he lets you see that, I, I think it actually is very effective. Um, not necessarily 
you know, they're not, they're not creating a new type of character here, right? We've seen this before in other movies. Uh, I think it is just a good rendition of that. Uh, effects. I thought the effects looked really good. Um, there are way more practical effects than you would expect in this movie. Um, some of the like fantasy races that you would sort of assume they would CGI in are practical, like prosthetics. Um, there, there seem to be like the Tabaxi seemed to be practical effects. Um, the Aarakocra, uh, the Dragonborn were did seem to be CGI, but there must have been something on set that was a very real prop because I, I felt like the physicality of them were, were so good. Um, just a lot of these various effects seemed to be uh, seemed to be physical and seemed, seemed very real. And the CGI was good. I mean, the spell effects, the owl bear, um, the dragon that you saw in that trailer, you know, all of that was was fine. But they you know they look like CGI. That's not um, a surprise. Well, it was a surprise was how much the movie looked better than CGI because it was real. So that was cool. Um, Absolutely loved all of the monster designs. That very faithful all the way through. Any anything from D and D canon that like, I felt like they had a team there that was like, these are the D and D guys. It, we're gonna ask them for ideas. Like, hey, what monster should we put in here? You know, what should we have over over this way? What would the Underdark be like? And like the D and D guys told them, and they did exactly what they were told. Um, so everything is very everything that was like true to D and D is very faithful. There were things that just like you can't get away from that is like not feasible in a D&D thing. Um, a lot of the combats, right, were, were like maybe one person against six or seven guards and they just smash their way through the six or seven guards and they you know, don't even get a hit off or anything like that. Um, but you know, that I mean, that is what it is. I think I did a video already about like how to play each of these characters based on the D&D Beyond stat blocks. I think I'm going to go back and up the level on those characters because these were not in an HP way. I would say everyone's, uh, it, it, <laughs> for the most part, bad guys missed, right? They did not hit the armor class. Um, but also, the heroes clearly had, like, there was a sense that the guards wouldn't be a problem the entire time. There was never, like, oh no, there's guards at the door. At no point was anyone concerned about, like, normal rank and file guards which I, I do feel like is a very D&D thing. Um, uh, all the heist stuff, all the planning was very tense, was very well executed. Um, and as I mentioned, there was, there was great relationships between all of the characters. I think the thing that was probably the worst was, was pacing. And um, this is kind of the, the mirror image to that plotting. There were so many times where I was like, okay, the movie's gonna begin now. No? Okay. All right, the movie's gonna begin now. No, okay. Um, and it was, it was very, it, it felt like it kept starting. Um, uh, like we're off on an adventure, and then, blah, 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 and then we're off on an adventure. Um, and it took a while to finally be like, okay, we are now off on the adventure, and that is, that is happening. Um, so the, I would say that the call to action happens pretty late into the movie, where, where it's finally like, okay, he, we know what we need to do, we know how to do it, and we're going to go and, and complete those tasks. That takes, I, I would say, probably, probably a third of the way through the movie is when everyone kind of like has a good idea of what the, actually, what the quest is going to be, right? Um, and there is some... There are some moments in here where I feel like uh, I really love that they carved out time for it. I'm the type of person where I'm sure if this movie was four hours long, I would still watch it. I would still enjoy it. Um, if you're the type of person who's like, like, get to the point, let's get to into the action, they definitely take a pause every 15 to 20 minutes or so, and they either talk about something or they make a joke that takes 30 seconds or, you know, they just like pan out to the scenery for a while. And given that like that like stopping and starting effect of the beginning of the movie, I can see someone getting impatient um, with this. I loved all of it. I, I want them to keep all of it, but um, I could imagine a version of events where, where you go into that theater and you're just like, come on, like, get to it. Like, let's, let's, let's do the movie. Um, I didn't feel that way, but uh, I there was a part of me in the back of my mind that was kind of like, hey, I wonder, uh, I wonder when they're gonna actually do 
the, the plot of the movie. I don't know. I don't know. It also felt very D and D in the sense of like the DM is like laying out these clues, like, hey, here's the main plot, and the characters are like, nope, none of that. That's not relevant to me until right at the very end when it's like you can't ignore it anymore. And I wouldn't be surprised if someone was like, did they foreshadow that this was going to happen? And someone sitting next to them was like, I don't think so. No one ever said anything. Um, yeah, the, the finale does kind of it, not come out of nowhere. But I do think that it is a little bit of like no one would no one cared about the this certain plot line until it was sort of shoved down you know shoved into their faces and then they were like fine you know I guess we'll care about this plot line and that was like the climactic finale um, and so there there is very much this sense I think in the pacing of like one final redirect one final like we we're trying to get to whatever this is G. Um, but wait, we've got to go to H, and then when they complete H, it's the, the you want they want you to have this feeling of like yes, like we've done it, like amazing, da da da, we're heroes, and you're like hey, what about G? What, what's going on there? And it's um, so there there are a lot of moving the goalposts plot wise that I think created created issues for pacing in the sense that like the momentum of the of the story kept needing to to redirect and you kept needing to like change what you care about as the viewer. Um, I thought I did a good job like with the overall like plotting and having everything interconnect and, and be interesting. I sort of like, I feel like the DM of this movie did a good job retroactively, but maybe didn't do enough prep work to have this feel more cohesive. Does that make sense? Like, they kind of went back and, and added details for the movie to be like, look, this all, it was all intended all along, but it does feel disjointed at parts, and, and that hurts the pacing because you lose the, a little bit of that momentum. We're gonna break into spoiler territory. Uh, do not watch uh, if you don't want spoilers. Spoiler warning. Um, so, the plot features, uh, this group, um, you know, it was, uh, Chris Pine, Michelle Rodriguez, uh, Chris Pine's daughter, um, Forge Fitzwilliam, and Simon, uh, was, like, the original crew, and they were five, basically, thieves that robbed people, and then, uh, Sophina, the wizard, uh, comes, and she wants to basically have them rob the, uh, the stronghold that um, Chris Pine's like spy order used to be a part of and this is a ruse she wants this red horn that is going to let her cast a spell that that can basically kill an entire city and raise them from the dead the red horn thing that seems to be like the main object of the film uh, is it's gotta have something to do with an undead army Um, and she has brought Forge Fitzwilliam in on the plan, and he's okay with it, so he's going to help trick the others into going and stealing this horn. Um, part of the bait for that is this tablet, which is a, a tablet of renewal, as you bring someone back that was killed by um, a red wizard's blade. Chris Pine wants it because his wife died um, from a red wizard's blade, so he's in on the plan, and Michelle Rodriguez's um, whole guy goes where he goes. Uh, they leave the kid at home, and uh, I feel like this. If you were, if you were like making this a campaign, I feel like this is where you basically uh, start the movie. Is is everyone's got their backstory, and this you're doing this heist on. Um, God, what was the name of the the group? I don't want to turn the camera off for this, so I guess I'm at. I was kind of surprised that um, Simon was in it so early on. We end up figuring out that uh, Simon, like, it has to part with the group after this this initial heist, and then they come back and they find him. Um, but I wasn't expecting Simon to be as big a part of the movie, just given how much um, you have um, Edgen and Holga, just the two of them, for for a lot of it. Let's see. The Harpers, that's right. So it's this Harper stronghold that they invade, and I feel like that's the real start of the campaign, uh, is you do this little stronghold thing, you go in, you get through the door, uh, and then 
Safina casts Time Stop once she gets what she's looking for, which does not operate the way that it would in game at all. It's like everyone gets to take a turn as they are trying to escape the Time Stop, uh, which is just like a little bubble that she shoots out around her. Um, Simon escapes, Forge escapes, and Sophina, of course, escapes because she's the one who cast it. Everyone else, Edgen uh, and Holga, basically uh, get caught and thrown in jail, and that's really where the movie starts, is with them in jail. And they do this, uh, this little, like, Court of Appeals bit where they explain their backstories as a part of, like, trying to get an appeal. Um, but that's all a ruse, because they, they get out of jail with an amazing Eric Hooker bit. By the way, this appeals bit where they are talking about, um, uh, waiting for this, this fourth council member he just peppers that in like every 30 seconds. I think that's when I realized I was like, oh, this is like going to be a movie that is is consistently light because bringing that bit back, you know, rule of threes, sure. Um, I think they used it four times, but uh, it was just like, they were very much aware of what's funny about that. Um, it was, it was a very good like, and again, Chris Pine, right? It is a very Chris Pine did a great job of like adding a little bit of that like urgency and like letting the mask slip to the point where I wasn't a hundred percent sure that was his real backstory because it was clearly part of some greater scheme to to try and uh, get you know get out of that that prison. Um, but you know, later events would confirm that that was that was true, and of course, you wouldn't waste that opportunity as a screenwriter to actually tell the uh, tell the backstory. So after escaping from prison, uh, the group the DM stops tracking uh, resources as they walk for days um, across a snowy tundra and eventually make it back home. Edwin's daughter is not there, um, but they figure out that Forge, who they asked to look after her. Um, is now the Lord of Neverwinter, uh, which is very, very cool. They head to Neverwinter and get to see him immediately, where it's sort of revealed that he has been telling Edgen's daughter that Edgen did all of this for money, he didn't, you know, care about the, her mother, um, that he made a stupid decision, and that don't worry, like, Forge is going to take care of her, Forge has her back. And so when they show up, she is, like, not on board with, um, on board with Edgen at all, and, uh, you know, she likes Holga still, but, um, basically Forge has turned her against, uh, against them, which is very, very, like, I, and it's not played in a joking way in any way. It's seriously quite distressing, um, for, you know, a parent who cares so deeply about his child to feel that child, um, you know, hate him and side with this person who's, who's essentially betrayed them. Um, and then Sophina comes out as they realize that the whole thing was a setup from the beginning. Um, but he, they kind of can't convince, uh, the daughter of this, uh, and then they're taken away, uh, and escape. So then it's, it's all about the, all right, let's get the crew together. And this kind of feels like another start to the movie, right? It's going to be another instance where, you know, so, so this is what I was talking about when I, I said earlier that, like, it felt like it kept starting. Like, the, um, the heist was like, okay, well, now we're going to start. No. Um, and then it's like, okay, the prison escape. Like, now we're going to start the campaign. And, yeah, kind of, like, okay, like, we, you know, the deception's been revealed. We're getting a group together. Like, now we're going to start the campaign. Um, and they do. They, they go out and they get Simon. So Simon shows them where to get Dork, and they grab Dork. Um, it seems like we're going to start with the, the bard, the barbarian, pick up the, uh, pick up the sorcerer, and then finally the, the druid later on. I think the pal And then she wild shapes in to scout around the palace. And um, she is caught, but she ends up finding out a bunch of stuff about it. And uh, makes it out and comes back to the party and, and they go, oh, it's got Mordenkind's lock on it, um, on the, on the safe where he's keeping the tablet that would keep, you know, bring my wife back or whatever. Um, there's nothing that we can, we can do about it. Uh, and then Simon mentions that the Helm of Disruption, this magical artifact that was lost long ago, would be able to break the seal. And so then it becomes like, okay, here's the fourth start to the movie. We're going to go and we're going to find the helmet 
and then we're going to use it to break the lock, and that's going to get us into the vault, get the tablet, which will prove that I'm telling the truth, and then that'll get my daughter. So that's the convolution that, that goes into that. Um, Doric hates Forge because he's uh, bad for the environment as a, as a ruler of Neverwinter, um, and Simon is, is with the gang just implicitly because he's uh, shitty at everything and uh, doesn't want to be shitty at everything anymore. From there, they go and they meet up with... Uh, I guess they do the Speak with Dead bit, which was excellent. That whole graveyard scene was, was really, really fantastic. Um, a, lot of, a lot of fun, and I think that the trailer did not even spoil all of the fun that they got to have interviewing all these dead people. So, uh, so they go and they speak with all the dead people, um, and that, that leads us to, um, to Zank, the paladin, that they go and talk to, and paladin leads them to um, you know, the Underdark, where they go... Uh, and fight off those those Thane assassins really easily, to be completely honest. Um, they deal with that dragon pretty easily as well, and then it's like, okay, we finally reached the end of the sequence, now we can take the helmet and go and do the thing, and then it's like, nope, Simon can't attune to the helmet, uh, it keeps blowing off of his head. I really like the way this movie did attunement, by the way. I, I kind of want to incorporate that into my games, just like, not a... A matter of like just take a long rest with it and you're good. This almost like spiritual aspect to attunement of a magic item, I don't know why it never really occurred to me. I think there is something that like I, I like to put in a, like a little flavor to the attunement, but I never thought of this being like in order to attune it requires you to like make this character decision or something like that. So Simon can't attune, but on in the process of getting there, Holga has visited her ex-husband and grabbed a magic item that she left with him uh, that she was unaware was a magic item. It's a staff that a wizard had, which is the Hither Thither Staff. Uh, this is essentially a portal gun that does the little portals, one side, that side, and then uh, you can go through. And so they come up with the plan, which I loved. This was potentially the best part of the movie for me, um, was this plan where they they plant a portal inside of a painting and then sneak the painting into like a lord's treasure which will then be placed in the vault so that they can then portal into the vault and this whole like plan that they come with like that involves everybody like doing their part it, there's some clever manipulation of like the physicality of the portal um some fun little like some things go wrong like some things go well i i enjoyed that a great deal. Um, and the, the, the way that that plays out is like perfectly, and it, it goes well, and then the painting that has the portal in it is left face down, which means there is like a very clean flush against the stone ground, and there's no way for them to get in. They can't like push on the stone ground to lift the portal up, that's like not how it works. So, Doric stays behind basically to chip at a little hole in the stone tile with a metal knife. Um, which, come to think of it, I think Holga probably could have grabbed an axe or something and done that a little bit better. But, um, is what it is. And then the rest of the group goes with another plan. They're gonna get uh, Simon into the vault itself and basically put him in a position where he either attunes to the helmet or is killed by the guards under the belief that when he really, his back is up against the wall, he is able to accomplish amazing things. Um, this is pretty much successful, except that the vault that he breaks into through the Mordenkheim's seal was a trap. Um, the reason for this is not that uh, Sophina noticed the wild shape and knows that the vault is compromised. It's that... Um, Forge has decided, or like Forge is part of his plan is to smuggle all the treasure out of the city on a boat. Um, so it's completely empty and is booby trapped with an Evard's black tentacles that grabs Olga and Simon, knocks them out. Um, and then Chris goes to get his daughter uh, and she is Sophina, you know, alter self or disguise self. -ed. So he makes an emotional plea to her, and she changes into Safina again, and grabs him with a tentacle as well. 
They had that great exchange, uh, and he convinces Forge to put them in the games. So that, like, maze part is really, um, like, they have been utterly defeated. Their whole plan has gone out the window, um, and the, the maze, the arena thing, is basically certain death. Lastly, uh, my prediction is that that maze situation that they have going on uh, is going to be right about the midpoint, right after they've discovered that they've been betrayed. It, it, it seemed pretty fun in the trailers, but all of the, the characters' reactions to things were like purely like sad, so I'm guessing that they are like at their low point there. So there's this much maligned part of the trailer where they jump into a gelatinous ooze while a, a displacer beast is jumping at them, which turns out to be a, a part of the plan because when people solve the maze, they, um, they move on to the next round. So the, all the monsters and like chests and stuff that are on the field get pulled down into like the, the workings of the thing. So they jump into the gelatinous cube because the gelatinous cube is gonna get pulled out of the arena and they don't wanna be in the arena anymore. It just so happens the displacer beast was about to get them when they, when they did this. Um, disappointed a little bit by how little the gelatinous cube damage seems to have done to everybody. Um, no one was burned. Uh, everyone complained about how much it hurt to be in there, but it wasn't, it didn't take any, you know, no one had any injuries, which is a bummer. Um, they then sort of figure out, so they find Forge, they, they beat him, um, and they are home free with a ship full of treasure, and uh, Chris Pine's daughter, who finally believes them because they got the tablet, and all of this, and it's like, they have everything they wanted, and they turn around, and Sophina has started to use this red horn to kill all of the citizens of Neverwinter. Um, she started with the rich people, so good for you, Safina, um, part, of, part of the revolution. Um, but she is going to make her way to everyone else. So this is the, the big hero moment where they decide they can't just sail off into the sunset with this treasure and his daughter. They have to go help people. I thought this was kind of interesting because a big part of the... Um, a big part of... Edgin's storyline was, hey, like, I left my daughter to go do this thing, which was, um, you know, raid the place and pick up this tablet to save my wife. Um, I left her and this is my greatest regret, right? I, you know, I should not have left. I should not have gone on this mission. I should have stayed with my daughter. And he makes her this promise, like, nothing's going to come in between our love ever again. And it's not that this is a bad decision to go back to Neverwinter. I did feel like it was a moment of... It was a moment where where the plot forced forced him to undermine that, that statement. Which I, I, you know, I think they could have done a little bit more with that. What they end up doing is basically he's like, I promised you that nothing would come between us, so like, you can join me on the suicide mission to go, <laughs> to go stop the Necromancer from killing everyone in Neverwinter. That, I, th I thought, was was tough, because, you know, obviously, you know, he's putting his daughter in harm's way in order to not leave her, because he has to go in, or else all the citizens will die. It's it's very, um, it's, it's every, every value is tugging on one another in that situation, and so I can't argue with how it ended up. All I can say is that it, I, I felt like it weakened his story a little bit for me. Um, they use the portal gun to uh, put a portal at the bottom of the treasure ship and then another one on the bottom of a blimp, which is quite, quite uh, far away. Um, and the treasure basically falls out of the blimp, forming a little trail of breadcrumbs so that the entire citizenry of Neverwinter leaves the arena chasing the treasure and Sophina uh, can't reach them with her kill everyone spell, uh, which is fun and I like that a lot. They also physically went into the city to fight her. Um, this battle is very, very cool. I think it's, it's one of the best action scenes of the whole movie. 
Um, I think it, it far surpasses anything that had to do with, like, the Thay assassins or any of the guards. Um, I think that there, there are some really awesome moments. Highlights for me include um, Simon's Bigby's hand, which, uh, you know, he kind of conjures to fight Sophina's Bigby's hand, and they have the, this hand battle where they're, like, wrestling. A good coming of age for Simon, who's been, you know, very, very self-conscious and has a lack of self-esteem and um, has been saying over and over again, like, Sophina's too good for me, Sophina's too powerful, like, I can't do anything. For, for them to, for him to pull out a fifth level spell, his only fifth level spell, as far as I can tell, and fight with Sophina is, is very, like, it's treated as, as a serious character moment. It's not a, it's not this throwaway joke that he has kind of been the whole time, which I really enjoyed. And also these hands were super cool. The effects, just that, like, hers is like this blood, like, muscly, like, gross fleshy hand and then his is like formed from the stone of the of Neverwinter a very like grounded um uh salt of the earth kind of hand that they they grapple with each other um there's also some really good moments um you know the the owlbear trying and eventually really losing uh, against um this stone dragon that she animates we see a meteor swarm go off um, a lot of really cool stuff there and this kind of transitions into um, a, a scene where they all go at Safina together. And it's it's really, I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the Marvel movies. I've watched a ton of them. I think that this particular, like, 12-second bit is up there with the best of the Marvel movies. Um, I mean, everything is happening at once. There is a lot of CGI here, but it's all super cool. Um, uh, Edgen is going in with his loot. Uh, Holgo with her axe, you know, Simon is shooting, like, Scorching Ray, um, the, the owlbear is coming out, it's, and then Sophina is doing a great job of, like, shield, like, throws this, Eldritch Blast, like, I, I think if you were doing Sophina's stat block, I think you probably gotta add Legendary Action cast a spell, because it does seem like she can cast a spell at the end of each player's turn, so she is shooting spells all over the place, and it is, um, it really is a, a fantastic spectacle, until finally she goes, you know, fuck this, does the time stop, um, and there's this fun twist where, where Simon pretends like he can't counterspell it, uh, but he actually has counterspelled it, and everyone else just freezes to make it seem like that it has worked, so that she stops fighting for a second. Um, Edgen's daughter, Invisible, clamps this, uh, this thing on her, and then what I really love what happens next, which is the owlbear comes in, and, um, you can tell that it's like, it's like, I want, like, all right, I take her out, like, okay, you kill her? No, I don't want to kill her, I just want to, you know, like, knock her unconscious. Well, she's got a hundred hit points left, so the hell bear is just there, like, bam, 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 just until, like, you could just, you would almost see, like, a little health bar on there, like, five, 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 boom, okay, finally, she's unconscious. Um... Yeah, non-lethal damage. Uh, uh, truly the humane way to go. Um, Holga is killed by a dagger. Uh, this is kind of bold. I don't think anyone's going to die. So what we've been told is the daggers of the Wizards of the Thay um, resist resurrection, they resist healing. If you're stabbed by one of these daggers, you're, you're done. The only thing in the entire world that can do it is this one tablet, and there's only one of them. So... Now, Edgen has a choice. He can use it to bring his wife back, um, his, his daughter's mother. Um, but Holga came in when the daughter was a baby and has been with her her whole life, like 10 years or whatever. So the daughter views Holga as her mother. Um, and obviously the rest of the party is like, you know, Holga is our, our friend and stuff like that. And, and same for, for Edgen. And so he has to make this, this very difficult choice, and uh, it relates back to a speech that he had, and I think it forms the, the core message of the film, which is actually a lot more potent than it's going to sound when I say it right now, which is just, you don't know, you don't know what you've lost or what you've gained until all the cards are on the table. And um, it's this feeling of, like, so what he says to the group when they are very, um, 
when they are at a low point of the film is your failures, like, like every time that you fail, it doesn't count until you give up, right? Is this idea of, um, like, sure, I, you know, my wife is dead, but if I get this tablet, then she's not dead. So she's not dead until I have given up grabbing this tablet. It's very much like, it's almost like a denial way of looking at things, but it's, it's, it's so much more interesting than denial would be. It's because, you know, it's a world of magic. It's a world of adventure. It, it's a lot of things. And so there's this sense like anything can happen. So therefore, you've no idea how things are going to end up until you get to the end. And, um, you know, he tells Simon, like, you've been a fuck up. Like, you've, you've, you've been unable to live up to your grandfather's legacy so far. But if you do, you know, one amazing thing, that all gets wiped away. So if you give up now, then that's who you are. If you keep going, even if you keep failing and keep messing up, then, you know, there's always the possibility of greatness in, in the future. And this is kind of inspiring. I, like, I think it is a legitimately, like, get yourself off the couch, you know, like, go and do the thing kind of inspiring. But it is a worldview that is rooted in this sense of, like, don't accept defeat. Like, do not accept loss. Do not allow, you know, don't let that into your head. And that's where Edgin's optimism comes from. That's where his, like, positivity and passion comes from, is it's this, like, fierce rejection of, um, of, like, consequences, of, like, letting something be bad. And uh, so it, it culminates in this moment where he chooses to bring Holga back, and in so doing finally accepts that his wife is dead um, and really dead and not coming back. And he makes this decision um, to, to essentially say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to prioritize the, the mother who has been there for my daughter um, over the, the one that, you know, that I let die essentially. And part of her, like the reason she's dead is because he did that thing. And, um, and I really liked that. I thought it was a lot more nuanced of a take than I was expecting from a movie like this. Um, just this thought of, like, it's actually, you know, accepting the consequences of your actions is actually more noble than solving them. Which is very, like, like not what you see every day. Like, I thought that was a particularly good um, lesson to, to, to learn, and it's fun for a D&D campaign because obviously, uh, to a certain degree, there is a sense from players of, like, I don't want anything bad to happen. Um, like, we can fix that with magic. Like, we can just go get a magic item and do that. Like, I get, you know, let's, I get one wish per day at a high level. Let's grind some XP. Um, and just the, the idea would be, like, the only way to get out of this problem is to say, I lost, and that's not going to change. Um, and the sadness of that, even as, like, obviously, we as the audience did not spend that much time with Edmund's wife. So, Holga is the one that we care about, and seeing her revived and, and up and awake is, is amazing. And, like, you know, the audience feel, felt sad when she died and felt joy when she came back, but that joy is twinged with so much, like, like, there are, you know, there's at least one other person who we, we just killed by bringing her back. And that, like, that sadness, ugh, oh, it's, it's hard to make a moment like that, but it is, um, you know, it, it, they made it happen. And Holga even wakes up, she goes, did you waste that fucking thing on me? And, you know, everyone else has decided, like, this was the right decision. And Holga herself recognizes, like, the, the pain and the sadness that that kind of comes with it, even though I'm sure she's grateful to, to be alive. I feel like all of these people are fun and charismatic enough, and this is like a family-friendly romp kind of thing, that, that no one's actually going to... Really, really cool. Really love that. And then they did a little epilogue where everyone kind of, you know, does the thing that they... Holga gets a new, a new husband, um, Doric and Simon are gonna, are gonna date now, and, um, uh, and Edgen obviously gets to you know, be a father to his daughter. 
So, um, you know, they did the, the whole epilogue thing and that was really good. But really, I mean, I was, I, I, the humor surprised me in that it was really good. The action was, was so, so good. Um, but it was this emotional core. It was this like lesson that was a lot more nuanced than just like, don't do bad things or like don't murder, you know, um, you know, with, with D and D it's kind of easy to be like dragons eat people. Therefore they're bad. You know, necromancers kill people. Therefore they're bad. And the ability to say like, yeah, but it like, but also you can be a functioning, compelling person who still has like a lesson they need to learn. I, I think that that was, um, it was a high bar that they had to reach in it. They really reached it, at least in my opinion. So I, yeah, I love the emotional core of that movie. Like I said, the, the pacing was tough for me, at least. I kept feeling like it was about to start, about to start, and then they'd, they'd go into a new thing, and then like, okay, we get to start, and okay, we get to... So um, that, I, I think, was not so great. I think it could have been streamlined a little bit more. Um, I think we maybe could have enjoyed certain segments for longer and made them a bigger part of the movie. Um, this really felt like a case where like all the bad guys had, you know, like 15 hit points and it was just like any time the fight broke out it was over in two rounds um, and whoever rolled the highest on initiative won basically. Um, but, you know, that, 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 that is what it is. It did get me thinking about how like, what would it be like to run a D&D game where um, you get all of your, your, you know, when you level up, you get all your same stuff, you get your spell slots up, you get your new abilities, you get, you know, all these, but your HP doesn't change, right? So you, you start with whatever it is, um, you know, 12 HP or 15 HP and level 2, level 3, level 4, level 5, you're getting all your new features, but you, you're still at that 15 HP. And you, you really have to worry about you know, all these different things that are happening. And if something's going to do 30 damage to you, it's going to kill you outright. So you've got to find a way to... I think that that would actually be kind of cool. It's kind of the answer to the... Um, a lot of people play like level 1 campaigns where it's like only level 1 the whole time. Um, and I, I think that like lack of progression would be really frustrating. But I, I, I kind of like the idea of like the no health campaign. Wherever you're getting more powerful but your body is still your body. I kind of like that idea. Because it was, it, I did feel like this was like, you, you know, enemies didn't hit, didn't hit, didn't hit, didn't hit, and then they hit and it was like, that person's dead. Um, and it's like, okay, maybe, maybe this is actually like more dramatic and interesting to be afraid of, you know, the attacks by guards or assassins or whatever it is. So, yeah, um, really love the movie. Uh, it gave me a lot of interesting ideas about like um, how I might incorporate some some things into my games. Um, I I I loved all the the characters, but really, I mean, this was a this is a Chris Pine. You know, uh, Edgen is the protagonist. Chris Pine is the core of this movie. I don't think that you could make a movie uh, in this franchise without Chris Pine in it or someone extremely similar to it. And I think the whole thing falls apart if you pull him out. Um, I mean, he was, he was definitely the star of the show. I hope that you, uh, if you're watching this, um, have enjoyed uh, Honor Amongst Thieves as well as I did, um, and are coming here to see, you know, kind of my thoughts were similar. If you've not seen it and have watched this with spoilers, you should still see it, still see the movie. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of moments that I did not talk about, um, because they didn't end up being sort of plot relevant, but, um... Yeah, I, uh, I had a blast. I hope you have a blast as well. Uh, and thanks for watching.